Last time it was precious. At the end, I just looked around, and you guys were all talking, and you were loving, and you were hugging on each other, and some of you were praying, some of you were crying, and I was like, yes, this is what it's about. And this is where my heart is, is just to unite women. And so that's why we're here tonight. So um, I want to tell you guys a little story that I heard this week. It's about Frank and Ethel. And I thought this story was just the cutest thing. They're an older couple, and Frank and Ethel got married, and um, they went to Gatlinburg. This has been years ago. They went to Gatlinburg, and they went into this small diner to have lunch, and they looked over, and they saw the helicopter rides, you know, the ones that I won't ride on that, you know, take you the scenic tours. And Frank said, oh, Ethel, I'd love to ride on that helicopter. And she said, no, Frank, honey. You know, we just got married. We're probably going to have kids. We need to buy a house. And $50 is $50. So he said, okay. Well, she was right. They had children, and they didn't, you know, he never even contemplated flying in the helicopter when they went down there on vacation with children. So then they went down again for their wedding anniversary. It was their 25th wedding anniversary, and they were in their 50s. And they went down, and same diner. Frank looks over, he's like, oh, Ethel, I'd like to ride that <coughs> helicopter. And she said, oh, no, Frank, $50 is $50, you know, and we're going to be retiring soon. We have to save our money. And so he reluctantly said, okay. Well, they're in their 80s, and their kids think, what can we do for them for their anniversary? So they pay for them to go to Gatlinburg, and there they sit, same diner, and they say, and Frank says, Ethel, I want to take that helicopter right now. And she's like, no, Frank, $50 is $50. Well, the pilot of the helicopter is sitting right behind him, and he hears him. He says, I'll make you guys a deal. I'll take you up in the helicopter, and if you guys stay completely quiet, don't say a word, it's free. He thinks there's no way that these two will stay quiet, right? And so he takes them up in the helicopter. He puts the headphones on himself and on them, and he doesn't hear them say a word. He was just sure they'd say something. So he starts doing some maneuvers, and he thinks this will get them. Not a word. Then he does this maneuver where he goes straight up in the air and almost down. It's very dangerous. He doesn't hear a word. So he, he takes the helicopter down and lands, and he says, You know what? You guys surprised me. I was just sure you'd say something. And I didn't hear a word out of either one of you. And Frank said, well, I almost said something when Ethel fell out, but $50. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So i got to make you ladies laugh. And I was trying to figure out how I tie that into the message. And it's this, ladies, no matter what the cost, we owe them Jesus. We've <clears throat> got to talk to them about Jesus, no matter what the cost is. So, a couple of things, like I told you last time, I want you guys to clear your hearts and your minds. I have been fought this week by the enemy, so that means that tonight's going to be good. I know that. I know who the enemy is, and I know that the Spirit's going to show up tonight, because I've been praying for that all week. People are going to get set free tonight. They're going to get delivered. They're going to be encouraged. I just believe that in my heart. So, I want you guys to close your... Just Leave the to-do list at home. The kids will be fine. The husband will be fine. The animals will be fine. Just take the next hour and a half to just worship the Lord and see what he has for you. Let him speak to your heart. And um, before we go into prayer, I had a prayer request. There was a lady that was with us last month. Her name is Melissa Travis. Her husband sent a text to me through someone else. And she is in the James Cancer Center, and they're inducing her into a coma for five days because her cancer's back and it's fractured her spine. But they're praying and believing for healing. So I'm going to ask you ladies to write her name in your journals, lift her up in prayer this week, and just pray and believe that God's going to use this as a testimony. We have other women who reached out to me and were unable to be here tonight because they have the flu. And James, who comes and helps us lead us in worship, his son Kingston has 102 fever this evening. So let's keep all of those in your prayer tonight. Her name was Melissa Travis. All right, ladies, if you will, let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. 
Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for each and every woman in this room. God, I just lift them up to you. You know their needs and you know their hearts. God, I just pray that you meet them right where they are. I pray, God, that you take my words tonight. You divide them a hundred ways, Lord, so that everyone leaves encouraged. And I pray tonight, God, for Melissa Travis. I pray, God, that your healing hand and your healing touch will be upon her. Lord, we know that by your stripes we are healed. God, we know that there are people suffering with the flu and with fevers. And there are even people in here, Lord, who have needs that need met physically, financially, emotionally. And God, we're just praying and believing that you'll meet each and every need. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> and now... Frank and Ethel. Frank and Ethel. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
for me. There is a in the gym at Marshall. Um, there's going to be James's wife, Crystal, and his mother-in-law. They have a team that dances with flags, and it's really beautiful. We want them to have enough room. It's going to be a special evening. Make sure you come. It's March 19th. I'll get it out on Facebook, but for those of you who have been that have been coming, it's going to be at the Marshall Gym on March the 19th. There will be more places to park. And um, make sure you bring a friend with you. They don't even have to have been on this journey. We just want them to get the word and to, and to be encouraged. So we'll be looking forward to that. So tonight, ladies, we're going to talk about living intentionally for Christ and letting your light shine in the darkness. So feel free to take notes. I hope I say something that's encouraging and that you want to take a note on. But in 2 Timothy 3.2, it says that in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power, have nothing to do with such people. Ladies, does that not sound like the world we're living in today? He accurately described the last days. But the good thing is, the darker the night, the brighter the light. And when I start talking about this, this is when I get excited. You know, in Esther we read, for if you remain silent at this time, relief for the Jews will come from another place. But who knows that you were born for such a time as this. Ladies, you were born for this time. I truly believe that God is rising up an army of women. That we're going to come together and we're going to stand in the gap for this generation. He's looking for women who's going to lace up their boots, step out of that mud puddle of self-pity and doubt and insecurity and fear and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to save my family. I am going to save my community, I am going to go out there and preach the gospel and preach Jesus Christ because they need it, ladies. But if you're going to stand up and fight, then you have to know that you have an enemy. And you have to know who your enemy is. And the enemy is not your unruly kid. It's not your in-laws that drive you crazy. Your enemy is the devil. The Bible tells us the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. It says that he roams around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And, but it says that, and that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers and high places and wickedness. But ladies, that's what makes us become eternity minded. And when we become eternity minded, life takes on a whole new meaning. You see, every person that you meet as somebody who has a destination, a soul that's got a destination of heaven or hell. So we have got to stay eternity minded because we owe this generation Jesus. So look to the neighbor on your right and say, stay eternity minded. <laughs> intentionally on purpose and you want to share the gospel 
You know, I'm going to give you a little secret here. When I was growing up, about how I do it, how I think it's effective, that doesn't mean it's right, but it's biblical. You know, when I was growing up, I thought that sharing the gospel because of things that I had seen meant that you walked up to someone and you said, Hi, do you know Jesus as your Savior? If not, you're going to hell. Can I pray with you? And often that, you know, there may be an instance that that's okay, but often it brings condemnation. But so I thought, how do I witness? So I started searching in the Bible. And in the Bible in Revelation in chapter 12, it says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Ladies, how many of you have a testimony? How many of you have been delivered from something? The Lord's healed you, delivered you from addiction, delivered you from depression. You all have a testimony to share. And when you get bold enough to share that testimony, the Lord's going to put people in your path. I have a friend who was abused as a child, sexually abused, and you wouldn't believe the young women that get brought in her path that have been through that. The Lord brings me people who didn't understand their worth and their identity in Christ, and I'm able to witness to them about how God can restore and build your identity in Him. And so I want to share a little story about that. There was a woman... I. The church that I used to go to, they were instrumental in starting the Hope Over Heroin events. And um, I had some 30-year-olds that were friends of mine. You know, there's that story in the Bible about the old donkey and the young donkey, and they should walk together while well, I was the old donkey. And I had some young donkeys that were friends that walked with me. And so we were going to the Hope Over Heroin event, and the one girl, her mother, used to be a Christian when she was a little girl, but she had become an addict. She was an alcoholic and a drug addict, and the, little, and the girl was just upset all the time. She was angry that she didn't have a mother. She was angry that she couldn't be a grandmother to her children. And uh, so she called me and she said, hey, can we pick up mom and take her to this Hope Over Heroin event? And I said, sure, we can do that. Now, ladies, this is where it's important. I could have been angry. My flesh, I love this girl, and I saw her suffer because of what her mother was doing to her. So I could have been angry when that woman got in the car. But I didn't need to be angry. The Lord said, you walk in love. You know, she already knew what she was doing to her daughter. I didn't need a reminder. So I loved her. She got in the car and we talked. And when we got to the Hope Over Heroin event, you know, I said, how about you and I go get a hot dog and a pop? She said, well, I said, come on. So we took a walk. And uh, she said, I've never been to one of these things before. I said, oh, I love them. When you see the addicts come up out of the baptismal and throw their needles on the ground, like it just warms my heart because there's hope. And I said, you know, there's people in our church that have been clean for months and years because they found Jesus. And she's like, really? And I said, yeah. And still wasn't reaching her yet. And I said, you know, I've never, I've never been an addict. I've never had to deal with that. I said, but boy, I was a broken hot mess about seven years ago. She's like, you? And I said, yeah. I was single. I was living in a tiny apartment. I was broken into a hundred pieces, but the Lord restored me. And you know what? The Lord is no respecter of persons. And if he'll do it for me, he'll do it for you. And that's when the wall came down. That's when I took my mask off and showed her that I had been broken. And so she opened up to me and she started talking. And she said, you know, I used to be in church. And she said, I used to love singing with the little kids, and I haven't done that for a long time. And I'll have you know, when I left Solid Rock Church, she was teaching Sunday school. She was singing with those kids because the Lord will restore. And you know, I, another thing that I didn't understand until three years ago, I thought that if you were in rural southern Ohio, you knew about Jesus, right? And you had just made a choice to not follow him. So a friend of mine, her son went to a, a school in North Adams, it is in North Adams, somewhere <coughs> down in Adams County, and he was 10 years old and he took his Bible to school. And the kids in his class said, what's that? And he said, it's a Bible. And they said, well, what do you mean it's a Bible? What's a Bible? And they said, you know, it talks about Jesus. And they said, who's Jesus? When I heard that story, I was blown away. We have a mission field right here in the United States. Other countries are sending missionaries to us. So it's time for us to get a voice, to be a light, to speak out and let people know that there's hope as we talk about being the light. We're going to talk about being the light, and it's how do we find the source of life? Well, we have to seek Him. 
In Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13, we read, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Ladies, we have to know Jesus before we can introduce him to someone else. There have been people who have sat on this church pew for years, and they've heard about him. It's become a religious activity. They come, they listen to the message, and they pray, but they've never known him. I often say that religion is for those afraid of hell and relationship is for those who have been there. Ladies, when the Lord has seen you through something, you have a testimony that you can share. And that's how you get to know him is when you seek him with all your heart. We have to talk to him. In Philippians 4, 6-7, it says, Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for what he's already done, and then you will experience the peace that surpasses all understanding as it guards your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. So by a show of hands, I want to know how many of you have ever worried about something and it's changed the outcome. <coughs> <laughs> We should thank him. We should talk to him and tell him what we need and be specific in our prayer. And what I like is it says, and thank him for what he's already done. And you know, I used to think that that meant you thanked him for the healing. You thanked him for the forgiveness. You thanked him for the food on the table when you didn't know how you were going to buy groceries. And it's a faith builder, right? Because he did it before, he'll do it again. But now I see that a different way. I believe that that's the way we're supposed to see it as a faith builder. But we're thanking him. We're speaking life for something that's not happened yet, but it's on its way. We're speaking of what's not as though it already were. We're saying, thank you, God, for the healing. It's not manifested yet, but I know it's on the way. It shows faith. It shows that we believe in him. Another thing that I want to talk to you about about prayer, is I got convicted a few months ago, or maybe it's been longer than that now, I was in between meetings at work, and I had about five minutes, and I did that mindless Facebook scroll. You guys know the one, you pick the phone up and you do this, just out of habit. And there's so many people with so many needs, and I saw a prayer request, and I almost typed, I'll be praying for you, and the Lord quickened my spirit, and he said, really? Are you going to pray for them? you got about three minutes left before the meeting. If you are not going to pray for them, don't you dare type that because people are taking prayer and they're reducing it to a, a simple condolence, the same as I'm thinking of you. I'm sending good vibes your way. He said prayer is powerful. Do not say you're going to pray unless you're going to pray. And when you do, you pray with fervency and with passion. That's just what he laid on my heart. <laughs> so... Um, and, so, and also, when we think about talking to him, how many of you have that one friend or relative that when you see their face pop up on your phone, you're like, oh, no, this is going to hurt. The only time they call me is when they want something. You all got one, don't you? Well, if we're made in the image of God, don't you think that sometimes it bothers him when the only time we come to him is when we've got a problem? He wants us to commune with him all the time and tell him, hey, God, it was a great day. Thank you for being with me. And communication <coughs> is a two-way street. How many of you ladies are like me? I used to be. He had to quicken my spirit about this. I'd pray, I'd get up, and I'd go out the door. And he's saying, wait, wait, I had something I wanted to tell you. I had somebody who I wanted to lay on your heart. So ladies, when you have the opportunity and you spend time with him in prayer, Take that extra few minutes to just sit and listen. See what he lays on your heart. And I want to share with you, I, talk, I call them my God downloads or my Jabez moments. I've been talking to Tiffany about my Jabez moments. and uh, So I want to share one with you. So there was a time when I had um, come in contact with a family that was very needy. They were homeless and I uh, was helping them out. And they finally got an apartment and they needed some things. 
And so um, a guy, I told the people that I worked with, and they all joined in. They wanted to buy them Christmas. They wanted to buy them gifts, and they wanted to buy the toys for the kids. And they didn't have a bed. They didn't have furniture. And our uh, director of engineering said, I'll give them a bed, but you got to come and get it. I'm like, okay, well, I'm single and I drive a Honda. I don't know how that's going to happen, but thank you. And so I'm praying about it, right? You know, I'm praying like, Lord, i got to get them this bed, and I'm not sure how to get it there. And I started trying to figure it out myself, and then I just kind of got quiet. And the Lord laid R.C. on my heart. Now, R.C. was a boy that worked in the, uh, on the dock. And I was like, well, okay. So I messaged R.C. and I said, R.C., I, I remember hearing you say you have a truck. Tim's got a bed. I need somebody to get the bed from Tim and get it to this family. I'll fill your truck up with gas, and I'll give you and your buddy each $25 if you can do this for me. And um, I get to get up the next morning. I'm putting, sending that message on Messenger. I get up the next morning, and I have a message from R.C. And he's like, you've got to come and see me as soon as you get to work. R.C.'s a Christian. I go see R.C. when I get to work, and he's like, Chris, you're not going to believe this. When I went to bed last night, my wife and I knelt down in prayer, and I was like, God, I got enough gas to get to work, but I don't have enough to get home. And you're going to make a way. I'm believing that you're going to make a way. And he said, when I woke up this morning and saw your message that you wanted to fill my truck up with gas and you wanted to pay me to move a bed, he said, I started screaming and yelling and thanking God and woke my wife up and she thought I'd done lost my mind. He said, but God answered my prayers. Ladies, when you surrender yourself, when you say, bring me the one, that's how you get those God moments. It's not me. I was just obedient. You know, God gets all the glory for that because just like Meredith said, he's interactive. He's interactive in every detail of our lives. And then we have to follow him. In John 8, 12, we read, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will be the light of life. He who follows me. How do we follow him? I have followers on social media, and if you follow me on social media, you know that I love my husband. I have to say that because he's standing back there. I love my husband, love my grandchildren. I think my grandson's cuter than anybody else's, you know. I have a heart for women to bring them together. I love the Lord. And, you know, so if you follow me on social media, you know that. Well, Jesus, he was the first tweeter. You guys have heard about tweeting? If you look in the Bible in red letters and you read the word, if you read this, you know what Jesus thought. You know what he thought. He tells us to humble ourselves. He tells us to pray. He tells us to seek him. If you want to follow Jesus, read the word and you'll get to understanding the heart of God and the, and the, and the heart of Jesus and his teachings. Now, if we want to follow Jesus, what does that look like? In Psalms 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible is called the living word. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, we read, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correct, correcting, and training in righteousness, so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Often when I want to act out in my flesh, I'll hear, Humble yourself. And it's funny how you put the scripture down in your soul, and when you're out and you're about and things happen, all of a sudden that scripture will rise up. And sometimes I think, I didn't even know I knew that. Well, where did that come from? But it helps you know how to handle a situation. The other thing we've got to do, ladies, is we've got to stay focused. If the devil can't defeat you, he'll distract you. I want to tell you real quick, you guys remember the story about Martha and Mary? Jesus is coming over to the house, and Martha is frantic, getting ready for Jesus to come over. Everything has to be perfect. She's a little OCD, not much unlike me. And she wants everything to be perfect. And Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus, and Martha gets ticked. And she comes out, and she's like, Jesus, are you going to tell her to get up and help me? And Jesus is like, Martha, Martha. You know, Mary knows what matters. She's sitting at my feet. And ladies, we get a to-do list a mile long and we get distracted. And it may be good stuff, but it doesn't mean that it's what God wants us to do. We have to stay connected with our families. God will redeem the time. I heard someone say, focus on your to-be list and not your to-do list. 
And you know, I'll share another little story with you about that. I'm that woman, and somebody tell me that I'm not the only one. I'm that woman that on the way to the party, I'm stopping to buy the gift, putting it in the bag outside before I walk in. Anybody else? Can I get a witness? Okay. Thank you for me not being alone. And so that's how I run all the time. And so I was having the Lord, you know, told me, he gave me a, a home in Cincinnati. And I shouldn't have had that home. You know, I lived in a tiny apartment, and God's map is amazing. And he gave me this big, beautiful home. It was a gift, like Meredith talked about. And I thought, I have to use this gift for God's glory. So I invited women to come to my house for a prayer meeting. And I didn't know who was going to show up. And it was so cool to open the door and see women. I didn't even know who they were. And see some that I did. And so it was that first prayer meeting was amazing. And you know, when... When Jesus goes after, Jesus talks about going after the one. And you know, when, the, when a wolf wants to get a sheep, which one does he get? He gets the one that's away from the pack, right? So ladies, if you're feeling isolated and alone, that's when the devil tries to get in your head. And so some of the women that came said, you know, I'm a single mother. I have three children. I was feeling so isolated and alone. I just needed this. I just needed to get together. So I'm telling you guys these stories because I want to encourage you. There are things you can do. You can open your home. You can reach out to women who, who seem to be alone. And so anyways, I was having women over the second, the second month, and I wanted everything to be nice for them. I always buy treats for them. You know, I had coffee and cookies, and I wanted flowers. Well, of course, they were going to be there at 2. It was noon. I had it timed out. I would got the house cleaned. I had just enough time to get to the store, buy the treats, Stop and get flowers and get home. Well, on the way home, I see a woman standing outside with a sign that says, Hungry. I'm hungry. I need food. And I was like, Well, Lord, send somebody to her, please, you know? <laughs> and he's like, I am. I'm sending you. I was like, Ah. Oh. You know? So I went and I bought her granola bars and water and stuff and took it back to her. And, and I asked her, I said, Honey, the Lord doesn't lay everybody on my heart that's standing out with a sign, but he laid you on my heart. So something tells me you used to know Jesus. And she said, I did. I did. And I've been, been away from him for a while. I said, well, let's pray. And if you start seeking him, he'll continue to take care of you. So I got home that day, and I didn't have flowers for the ladies like I had wanted. But I believe my obedience is why the Spirit of God fell on my house that day. And women were set free. They were... Um, relieved from things that had been holding them back and they and they talked and they prayed and I believe when we just like Mary when we seek the presence of the Lord that's when he shows up that's when things change it doesn't have to be about the flowers about the house looking so so and Tom has to constantly remind me that he'll every once in a while look at me and say Martha Martha you know <laughs> so look at your neighbor on your right and say don't be a Martha <laughs> So how do we turn our lights on? Acts 2.38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living on the inside of you, and He guides us into all truth. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, and will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. As this verse says, we have to come out from the darkness. Once you say you're a Christian, people are going to be watching, and they're going to see if you act different. You've got to show them you got to walk in love. And what does walking in love look like? Well, sometimes broken looks angry and mean. And you know it's easy to love when it's easy to love. It's easy to serve when it's easy to serve. But sometimes it's a little harder when people are angry and mean. My mom had a sign hanging on her wall that said, People need loving the most when they deserve it the least. So to share an example with you, um, my job at work, I started there three years ago, and my job is to do process review, so I have to know what everybody's doing. 
and there was one woman at work that just wasn't real happy about that. And she was telling people she needs to stay out of my Kool-Aid. She didn't like me at all. <laughs> and so, you know, there was a day that I made a mistake, and this woman decided it was appropriate to email everyone all the way up to the vice president to let them know I had made a mistake. And uh, <clears throat> she would have probably emailed the President Trump if she'd have had his email address. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the directors sent me a text. She wanted to have a meeting on Monday. And one of the directors sent me a text and said, you are not meeting with her. You didn't do anything wrong. You don't have to put up with this. And my flesh was like, and God said, humble yourself. Walk in love. This is an, this is an opportunity just to come out from the darkness. And so I sent my director a text, and I said, you know, I'm a Christian, and the Lord wants me to love her. If she's that mean and that hateful, she's obviously broken. I need to pray for her. There's something going on in her life that's causing her to be that mean and that broken. And so I let it go. Ladies, write this down. When you are not easily offended, life gets a whole lot easier. And so... I didn't let it bother me. I went home. I enjoyed the weekend. I had a great time. I guarantee you, she stewed over it all weekend, right? She let it steal her peace and her joy. And so Monday, I pull my phone out to see what my, what my day is going to look like. And it's like, oh, I've got that meeting with her. And I was driving. And, of course, I looked at my phone when I was stopped, okay? And I was driving. <laughs> and the Lord said, all of a sudden, that scripture rose up. I will prepare a table before your enemies, Right? So I walked into the conference room to that meeting at that table, and there she sat. And I smiled at her, and I complimented her on her shirt. And I asked if she had a good weekend, and everything changed. Uh -huh. And she's been nice to me ever since, because the devil doesn't understand love. Love wins every time. The Bible says the greatest of these is love. When we walk in love instead of in the flesh, and we walk in the spirit, the devil doesn't know how to combat that. That's the hardest thing for us to do sometimes. One more story and then I'll close. Um, like I said, it's easy to serve when it's easy to serve. And, and there was a time I was speaking at, a, at an event locally here not too long ago. And the, they had the, the pews blocked off. It was two sections in the church. And they had them blocked off to where everybody had to sit up front. And um, most of the people were sitting on the left side, and when I walked in with my friend who went with me, we sat on the right, and we sat a few pews back. And all of a sudden, right before the service started, a lady came in, and um, she, she didn't smell very well. And it, and it was bad, and I was concerned about the girl I had with me, because she had been sexually abused as a child, and so there were things that bothered her, smells, Bugs. She had a fear of bugs. Like Meredith said, once you come through some trauma, there's some things you deal with, anxiety and fear. And so they got up, and, and we went to eat. And when we come back, to try to be kind, I said, Now, Andrea, if you want to sit on the front row, I, I need somebody to take pictures and, and to video for me while I'm speaking. Because I didn't want to be rude, and I wanted to be kind. And she's like, No, I'm good. I'll stay here. And I was like, Okay. So I went, and I spoke. When I was done, I, was, I went back to my seat, which was right behind this woman, and I'm turning around, and people are telling me how they enjoy the message and um, asking about my book, and I turn back around, and there's Andrea. She's got that woman in her arms, and she's crying, and she's praying with her, and she's loving on her, and that was more powerful than anything I said. That was being love in action. That was, when you're going to love people, it's not going to always be easy. Sometimes sin smells. Sometimes, when you've got to be willing to get down in the gutter with these people and say, God loves you. God loves you. That is probably, when we got in the car, I said, I am so proud of you. You know, you humbled me because you humbled yourself and you loved on that woman. She said, you know what, Chris, she's got six kids. None of them come to see her, and I bet she hasn't had a hug in years. Never underestimate what your kindness will do. So as I prepare to close, I want to share the same verse with you I started with. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. 
There's a story about these kids. They were out in the car and they were joyriding down the road. They come to a railroad crossing and a train hit them and they all died. The, the train company was getting, or the railroad was getting sued. And the watchman, this was back in the days when they had watchmen at the railroad, the, the watchman was on trial. He had to testify because the, the railroad was on trial. They called him up on the stand and they said, were you there the night of the accident? And he said, I was. And they said, did you, did you see the car coming? And he said, I did. And they said, did you have your lamp? He said, yes, I had my lamp. And they said, did you wave it? He said, oh, I waved that lamp. I waved it and waved it. And they said, okay, you're dismissed. He got out in the hallway and he was crying and shaking. And his wife said, honey, are you okay? Did you testify? He said, yeah, I testified. She said, did you tell the truth? He said, yeah, I told the truth. He said, I'm just glad they never asked me if my lamp, if my lamp was on. Ladies, we're in a lost and dying world, and we need our lights on. And if you have not given your life to Christ, or if you have and you haven't been baptized and you want to be, my husband's here tonight, the water's warm, I'm inviting you. If anybody wants to come and be baptized that hasn't been, you're welcome to. If you don't want to do it now, you're welcome to see me afterwards when everybody leaves, and we'd be glad to get you baptized tonight. Is there anybody that wants to come forward? Usually I have music playing, but Paige had to leave. <laughs> Is there anybody that, that wants to come forward and give their heart to Christ that hasn't or be baptized? I checked the water. It's warm. <laughs> Well, if not, let's bow our heads and close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for each and every lady in this room. Lord, I hope they leave. I hope they leave ready to let their light shine in this dark world. Lord, give them, brave, give them braveness. Let them have a holy boldness to rise up and speak life into those around them, Lord, who don't know you. I just thank you. I pray for a hedge of protection for them as they travel. I pray for the ones that couldn't be with us tonight because of illness. And Lord, I just pray that you keep these ladies in your care. Keep them seeking you until I see them again next month. Devin, I want you to be after me. Find in the scriptures. I believe. Jesus Christ, all these bones to sing, the Son of God, all these lungs to sing, the one you're the face of the face, the you're being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ.